It is my pleasure to introduce the clinicians for our next session. Pam Smith-Kelly is the daughter of Claude T. and Maureen F. Smith. She taught instrumental and choral music for 35 years in the Fort Zumwalt and Blue Valley School Districts, as well as adjunct at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and Ottawa University. She was the founding conductor of two prominent wind ensembles in Kansas City, the Kansas City Wind Ensemble and Midwest Winds. Pam is the president of Claude T. Smith Publications Incorporated, which, in pub which publishes the instrumental and choral works of her late father. Please welcome Pam Smith Kelly. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, it's so great to see so many dear people out here in the audience. It's fantastic. People that have loved dance music and people that maybe have never played dance music. So we are trying to spread the word about the early band music and um, just give you lots of interesting facts today. So first of all, I'd like to thank Craig and the MMEA board for selecting us to present today. And we really, really appreciate it because this is dad time. And it was just such a special treat to be able to be here. Secondly, I'd like to thank our panelists today. And you can read about all of them in your handout. If you didn't get a handout, they're over there. So make sure you pick one up, pick one up for a friend or just take one home if you need another one. Um, these people are also just very dear friends of mine and very, very, very dear friends of my dad's. So you will read about all them and you'll hear from them. And thirdly, I'd like to thank Barnhouse, CL Barnhouse, with Andy Glover, the Executive Vice President, who's gonna be your moderator, and Kim Benson, who's back at home getting more things done. He drove from Oskaloosa yesterday, so he braved the elements and got here. And um, we were so lucky four years ago to be asked to um, have them be our district for Clark D. Smith Publications. And so without further ado, we'll let Andy tell you a little bit more. Thanks, Pam. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> and as Pam alluded to, this is uh, Sorry, I'm going off script just a little bit here, but uh, this is really great that we're doing this here at MMEA and doing this here at Cantera because not only was Claude a wonderful composer and a wonderful musician, as, as many of you know, but Claude was one of us. He was an MMEA member, a very prominent uh, and successful music educator here in the state of Missouri. He was active in the leadership of MMEA. Uh, he's a member of the MMEA Hall of Fame and uh, he was one of the part of the leadership group in the late 1970s uh, which included my high school band director ed carson and bill maupin who was claude's uh, colleague at chillicothe that moved this convention from jefferson city down here to tantara at lake of the ozarks and if you're my age or older you remember those not so good old days of the ramada and jeff city and if you think this show is crowded now at Tantera, folks, you should have seen it back in the 70s at the Ramada Energy of City. So we, we owe Claude an awful lot for what he's done with music, but MMBA also owes him a, a great debt of gratitude for his service to the organization and all of the things that he did to help uh, transition this event to uh, the location we're at now. Um, as Pam mentioned, we have a handout here that has biographies of all of the panelists. I don't want to take time to read through those because uh, we want to focus as much time as we can on Claude and his music and the resurgence that it's undergoing presently. Uh, of course, many of you know some or all of these panelists as they are people that have been in our midst for quite some time and um, I invite you to read about them in the handout that you have. Um, Pam asked me to start by talking a little bit about uh, the time, we have to turn back the clock a little bit to when Claude was first uh, getting his music published in the early 1960s. And band music was very different uh, in the early 1960s than it is today. There was a great history of bands playing music in very traditional forms and styles. Marches, transcriptions from orchestral works, uh, lighter novelty type pieces, popular music. Uh, town bands and municipal bands would play show tune medleys and things of that nature. There was an interest, uh, particularly with composers who were writing music at the college and university and higher levels for music that was more of a high art nature, that was uh, using new vocabularies in terms of harmony and styles and rhythms. But Claude was one of the very first composers 
to bring some of those sensibilities to the accessibility of high school and middle school students. He had the composing chops to be able to do things that sounded different and were unique and uh, away from these established forms uh, of the older music, but put it within the grasp of musicians at the uh, public school level. And that, to me, is one of his, his great legacies. Um, if you look at Emperor Overture, which is Claude's most famous work, and it was one of his first published works in 1964, I believe, and uh, one of the things that made Emperor so unique was the fact that you know, there were different colors and tonalities that were happening, and he was using different uh, sonorities in the band, like low woodwinds. You hear a lot of great bassoon and bass clarinet and contrabass clarinet, and excellent use of tenor and bass saxes, low trombones, horns, uh, these are things that really had never been fully exploited in scoring for concert band, and Claude became a, a real master at that. And you can't really talk about Claude or his music, or especially Eberato, without talking about Seven Eight Time and the meters. Uh, as many of you know, he was very fond of using uh, mixed meters, and in particular Seven Eight Time. And one of my starkest memories of being a high school musician in 1975 was playing Emperata in the second band at Webster Groves High School under Ed Carson. And we were reading along with Emperata, and near the beginning there's that 7-8 bar the first few years, and the band crashed and burned. And we stopped, and Ed explained very simply, the eighth note always gets half a beat. Whether there's eight of them in a measure, or seven of them in a measure, the eighth note always gets half a beat. And after a couple passes at it, we had it figured out. And Claude used those mixed meters in a way that nobody had before, and he did them always in a way that it advanced the music. It wasn't just for the effect of throwing some crazy counting arbitrarily into the score. It all served a musical purpose, and so he was really, um, uh, really excelled at that. Uh, one more footnote about Emperor Overture was that this was such a new sound in 1964 that Claude had some trouble getting the piece published. He shopped it around to various publishers who, for one reason or another, didn't want to take a chance on it. And he had, one of the companies that he sent it to was Barnhouse. And uh, Chuck Barnhouse, the grandson of the founder, turned it down. And that's living proof that publishers don't always make the right decisions. Um, I sure wish we had published it because things could have been an awful lot, lot different. But this was at a time before uh, many of the composers that are now considered people from a previous era, Alfred Reed, and some of those folks are writing for bands. So Claude was really one of the great innovators in uh, concert band music in the early 1960s. Um, so his legacy is, is something that stays with us today, and as we talk this afternoon a little bit more about how his music is making a resurgence, we'll give you some examples of that. We're going to turn to the panel now and, and uh, talk with some of our our uh, distinguished panelists here. And we're gonna start with Johnny Woody here in the middle. Uh, thank you, Johnny, for being here with us today. And I know you had a long association with Claude. And tell us a little bit about how you met him and about your experiences with the Peace Festival Variations. Okay, Claude, Claude and I get into this one. Yes, Claude and I met 1956 when I was joined the KU band at the University of Kansas and uh, under Russell L. White. <laughs> Some people remember that name. Um, 56, Paul Smith was principal one, and I was fifth one. And I played on high school all the way through high school on a single F horn. Played the whole state orchestra in, in Missouri three times on a single F horn. I didn't know any difference. I didn't know it was hard, you know. Anyway, I got my double in KU. I'm playing sit fifth chair. I'm sitting next to a young lady by the name of Doris Zinzol. And, and uh, she had a sound to die for. I could out play her technically, but sound wise I couldn't come close. But that was a sound I wanted. So I got that sound. And she was <coughs> a jewel of a little lady. Anyway, he was uh, my second semester of freshman year. I was asked to join the faculty woodwind quintet. The horn teacher, Jerry Carney, did not play horn anymore. So for three and a half years, I played the faculty groups. That's where I learned to play. Claude would join us when 
thought I was playing. I needed another home to put up this plane second time. So that's where it, this idea of him kicking, me kicking him off his chair comes from, I think. Because Philip was more interested in composing than he was playing. Now, Festival of Variations, on the other hand, is another story. In 1981, probably, Colonel what Arnold Gabriel commissioned Claude to write a piece for the us, for the band, the United States Air Force Band, in Washington, to play. Now, I think I talked to the Colonel not that long ago, and I said, how much did, did it cost? How much did we pay Claude for the festival variation? He said, probably about $5,000. So what a deal, you know, $5,000 for festival variations. So he wrote that, and the day we rehearsed it, First day, we played through it once. We took a break. I went across to the audio room, picked up the phone, called the phone. I said, you son of a <laughs> pregnant female dog. <laughs> I cleaned that eyes. I did a shorter version of that. And, and uh, I'll help. <laughs> so I had to play that piece between 65 and 70 times in two and a half years. We played it on five tours, and it was a it, it was a general audiences every time. That piece, Claude had a way of writing endings where there were almost automatic standing ovations. Festival Variations was definitely that. We premiered it in 1982 at TNEA, Texas Music Educators, National MANC in San Antonio. When we were playing the piece, the audience was so loud. There was constant talking. And as we're playing it, the people were, do well, they like this piece? Well, why, why are they so noisy? Well, I was working the booth uh, after the, uh, we played the concert the next day. And I found out that people were commenting on what they were hearing. Oh my gosh, I was like, that's not what the horn players did that, you know, all this kind of stuff. The horn parts were written for me, according to Claude, to pay me back for kicking him off for <laughs> <laughs> He paid me back big time. <laughs> big time. Playing it that many times and never missing it. We never missed it. My old section never missed any of those licks. And if you've ever heard the piece, you know how difficult it is. Because of that, I think it allowed people to, other composers, to write what they wanted, not to write just to get published. And because of that, band music got better and better and better. Uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's it. Okay. okay. Thank you, Johnny, very much. Andrew Yates was uh, scheduled to be on our panel today, but at the last minute was unable to be here due to some complications. Um, Andy worked as a copyist for Claude in the 1980s, and uh, for those of you in the audience who are younger, the word copyist may not make a lot of sense to you, but in the days before computer music notation programs like Finale and Sibelius, we of course wrote everything the old-fashioned way by hand and Claude wrote everything, all of his works were done by hand in, with a full score, and then a copyist would write out the parts for the individual instruments. So uh, with Andy not being here, Robin Thompson has agreed to kind of fill in for Andy and, and tell us a little bit about that process and what Andy went through. Thank goodness we had him write out the script. <laughs> so I know what he's supposed to say. Well, uh, he, he likes to tell the story that he always has said that getting a Claude Smith uh, manuscript as a copyist was like having a front row seat, seeing the music that had only been heard in the mind of its composer. Because Claude didn't sit at the piano. He, he was at a desk. It was all in his head. Uh, Andy first met Claude when he was a student at Fort Osage High School in Independence. And he was asked, uh, at one point to, if he wanted to meet Claude. And he said, I was a nervous wreck. He said, this was Claude Smith for heaven's sakes. But uh, as most people did, he found him to be extremely friendly 
and put him at ease. And that is one of the things I heard from most people that knew him would say he was very accessible, he was a kind gentleman. And, and that, that is what he was able to find out too. Well, several years later, when he was a student at UMKC uh, Conservatory, he worked part-time at Winger Jones, and Claude approached him about copying the music for it. And one of the first pieces he did was Rejoice in Glorious Hope. I think this is so funny, I'm gonna interject. Pam and I were listening to that on the way down, where we were trying to find some uh, music that we wanted to play at church, in church orchestra. And so we were listening to that. And I have uh, some ideas about that, but it's, it's very church related, so I'll tell you some other time if you wanna hear about it. <laughs> uh, he said he did not use a ruler. And he said this is important to understand. So he, uh, he came back to, to Claude with his, what he had uh, written, and he was not happy. He was not happy with Andy's freehand copy. So a few months later, he was asked to copy some more for Claude. And this told time, he told him, you have to use a ruler. You must use a ruler. And Andy was going to have that very ruler here. He has it still, that same ruler. It, it, it's only like three inches long now, though. <laughs> Uh, but Claude only wanted him to copy some woodwood parts and you know to see if he could clean it up and do it a little bit better and, and follow directions. So he finished the bassoon part and he took a little breath and realized it looked pretty good. So and he'd been copying for about two and a half hours. So then he called Claude and he said, I'm finished. He said, You are? And so then uh, Andy took the music over to him because he was only five minutes away. And he called him back in a few hours and asked our and uh, asked me to come back and you know get some more manuscript paper and get copying. He said, uh, he said, well, what do you think about my my copy? He said, 110 percent improvement. And I want you to know that Andy tells that little story a lot because that meant so much coming from Claude to be told that. So I, that I I love that. Then he opened up the floodgates on Andy, and he cop copied uh, so much music for him. He can't even remember all the titles, plus a lot of them didn't have titles yet when he was doing the copy work. So um, then he uh, was, you know, uh, copying the music, and then Claude wrote uh, his three technique books. If you are not familiar with those, uh, there's three <coughs> method books, and if you really want your band to uh, get better, <laughs> you want to look into those method books because they will train your band. It's not just, you know, if you're working on scales, you're not just playing a scale. He has dynamics and all of that kind of thing in there. Is that something you talk about? I forgot, sorry. Um, anyway, he was working on uh, symphonic rhythms and scales and symphonic techniques, and he did all of the copy work for that, and he was on the second book, and he, it was really, it's really odd, we're here at MMEA, and he was playing as a drummer in the lounge, it was called Der Krug back then, and uh, he was playing in a lounge there, and Claude gave him the stuff to copy here at MMEA, and, and then uh, when he got done with it, Andy was still here playing, he stayed here, he, you know, he was playing all the time here. And so he had to find a way to get the music up to Claude. And so he figured out a way to uh, take it to a bus stop. He had to go to, well, no, he had to go to a gift shop here at Osage Beach at 6 a.m. And then, uh, which was tough because he'd been playing to like one or two o'clock in the morning at the lounge. And then a bus would take it to 40 Highway at Nolan Road to this, and he calls it a uh, flea bag no tell motel. <laughs> There's an olive garden there now. And then, uh, and then they, it would take it to that, they would, it would drop off at the hotel, and then Claude would come to the hotel and pick it up. And he said he used to tease him and say, I can't believe Claude, that 
this upstanding, world-renowned composer walking into this Fleabag Motel to pick up a package. Now, you know, what do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> so that was, you know, something interesting about how the music got to the copy is. Uh, when they started the work on the third book, and he was just starting to copy, about a quarter of the way through, Claude called him and said, stop. And then he saw him a few late, days later, and he said, Jensen just bought, uh, spent a million dollars for a computer that can engrave music. And Andy said, really, a computer that engraves music? And of course, now, nobody thinks anything of it. They, you know, everything's engraved on the computer, and nobody thinks about what it was like to engrave music back with a ruler and a pencil. So, uh, yesterday, no, this morning, this morning, yeah, this morning, gosh, it seemed like yesterday, this morning, Lafayette County uh, High School Band played Declaration of Overture. And it's really interesting, he wrote about that in this, it, it's all just connecting. And he said, I was studying Declaration, and I was analyzing and studying it, and it was written in 1975 and dedicated to Claude's wife and Pam's mom, Marie. And uh, if you've ever listened to it, played it, there's a five note motive that is used throughout the, the piece. And then especially at the end, it's very uh, elongated, the notes are and very specific. And he said that his, it was his hunch, his thought, that in that, Claude was saying, uh, Maureen, I love you. And he wrote, he ran into, he doesn't have proof of that, but he ran into Maureen later, and he, he told her about it. She said, and if, if those of you who knew Maureen, she's a petite, quiet little lady, and she looked at him and said, well, isn't that nice? Well, then Pam put that story in her book, so Andy thought that was pretty cool. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> Uh, we're going to turn to Pam next, and as we all know, Pam, you're Claude's daughter. And so you were around music your whole life, your whole childhood. Um, so you were around it at home, and of course you were your dad's student as well in school. And so tell us a little bit about your experiences with Claude's teaching philosophies as it related to his compositions, and also talk a little bit about how his reputation as a composer isn't just a Missouri thing. It really uh, it goes to the national and the international scale. Okay, first of all, um, many of you knew my dad, and he was a master teacher in my mind. He knew what he wanted, and he knew how to get it out of kids. He wanted the best full band sound, and that goes all the way back to KU days, where they had that big full sound that Johnny was talking about. He wanted that with his band. <coughs> He did compose mainly at his desk at school, and thank goodness Bill Maupin, who's no longer with us, his best friend, besides all of these people who weren't here, but his best colleague friend that he taught with, did all the attendance, he did all the money collecting, he did all that, and there's dad right at the desk. So he would just kind of push it away and then do school stuff and throw it back and then do it this all the time. He wrote some at home, but he never really sat at the piano, except in very early days. And in the later days, it's very funny to know this, because he would write, he'd find an empty airport um, desk, and when he would be flying different places, he would pull out a piece and spread it all over, and people would ask him, what are you doing, what are you doing? And so he goes, well, I'm writing some music. You can write it without a piano, on the piano. So he wrote it on the road a lot. The last couple of years of his life were very busy. He was gone almost every week. So he had to use that time um, in airport terminals and wherever he was. Um, I was so blessed as a kid. I didn't know what I had, you know, when I was younger. I didn't know how blessed I was, it was just my dad. And he was quite a great father a great teacher, all of those things, but I was so lucky to get to sit and be a part of him writing and conducting, and I played for him. Bill Maupin taught me <clears throat> to play bassoon. So, 
Yep, I learned how to play bassoon and was in Dad's band, but it was quite wonderful to just watch it all happen. Now, speaking of that learning in Chillicothe, we were the guinea pig band. Whenever he had a commission, he tried everything out on us. There's Sarah Kevin up there in Chillicothe. I'm sure there's notes still flying around or things went on. <clears throat> but we were the guinea pigs, and what would happen was that we would read through the next piece he was going to take somewhere. And we would read it, and if it was too easy, he'd say, I'll bring more parts tomorrow. Or I'll change, i got to change a few things. So the next day he would come back with this little teeny piece of manuscript paper and rubber cement, and then look over the stand and put it right where it was supposed to be on our parts. He knew exactly where it was. And so we had another part to play that day. And if it was too easy yet, we got another slip on the next day until he got exactly what he wanted in all of his parts. The other thing is he really wanted everybody to have an interesting part to play. And I think that's in every single piece and the way it's scored. If you don't have, as this morning, if you don't have a bassoon, you have other instruments that can take over. If you don't have a horn, you can have the saxophones. But he did it in a way that you kind of disguise that part. So the scoring was just amazing to me. The more I've, I've lived with it. Um, <clears throat> also, he wanted the parts to be challenging, especially for the percussion section. They were always messing around in the back and always in the drum closet. And so he's if specifically, if you look at a lot of his scoring, he writes lots of percussion parts because nobody was going to sit still. And if they did, they'd have ad lib this or ad lib that or do something or double up. So just another little thing on him. Um, he also knew what pieces kids needed to have in order to teach the fundamentals that he and Bill insisted on. Um, they were based, all these pieces were based on the knowledge of what band directors needed to teach. They weren't just pieces for pieces sake. They were there to teach a certain, certain fundamental. Now, Dad also paid tribute through the years to schools, people, and organizations that had influenced him and supported him. Um, Anthem for Winds of Percussion, if you played that, raise your hand if you might have played that. One of my favorites. It was written for his high school band director, Harold Lerhart. And Harold actually was the one who got him his first job in Cozad, Nebraska. So Harold was a very, very important person in his life. Joyance was commissioned, how many of you have played Joyance? By Central Methodist in 1975 and by Central Methodist, and it was premiered, actually, at MMEA in Jefferson City in 1975. He wrote Choral Prelude, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart, in 1985, 10 years later, for their 75th anniversary. You've heard of Stanberry uniforms, right? They commissioned Dad in 1970 to write Sonus Venturum for North Central Bandmasters Association, when they ran. As an MBA member, he wrote Merrimack Rhapsody for 1985 All-State Band. At the same time, he also wrote for MMEA Rejoice in Celebration, which is going to be published soon. And that was for band, orchestra, and choir. I don't think that was not such a great idea at the time because they've never done band, orchestra, and choir finale at the same time. But that year they did it, and wasn't that the year of the snow? The horrible snowstorm? So, um, but that was amazing. Dad was the orchestra, or the band director, on our um, band, and um, I'll stay, and wrote those two pieces all at the same time. Then it led into different things for the Air Force, Navy, Marine, and Army field bands, as well as featured virtuoso soloists such as Brian Bowman, Dale Underwood, Rich Madison, Steve Seward, who is here in, at MMEA this week, and two solos for Doc Severinsen. So, as well as getting back at Johnny playing first one. <laughs> so in your handout, you're gonna see 60 pieces that are related to Missouri. When I started writing the list, I thought, oh, there's probably 20, and then there's 30, and then there's 40, and then finally 60. So if you would like, 
we have a, a stack of them over there, but if you would like us to email you that, that's what that list is for, we will email you um, the whole compilation of every piece of music that he wrote and where it is in the publishing cycle and things like that. Thank you, Pam. <clears throat> Russ Coleman, we want to also thank you for joining our panel today. You had a close relationship with Claude for many years, a contemporary of his, and share with us some of the uh, compositions you were involved in the commissioning. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak about Claude. I came to what is now the University of Central Missouri in 1964, in the spring. In the spring, the concert had a short tour in the Kansas City area, and we played at Center High School, where Claude was the director. I believe it was the first time we met, other than possibly in a new teaching uh, reading session. I, I remember first he was trying to find the timpani for us to use, and that was the first time we got uh, to know each other. Uh, it started just a very special, lifelong friendship, and we spent many times together going out to dinner with our wives. He had been, that last dinner, he had been to our house in December of 1987. And I always remember, as he left our house, his final words, he stopped and turned around and said, we need to get together more often. Later that spring, in 1965, the Center High School Band played up on an overture at music contest on our campus. It was in manuscript, and unfortunately, Claude was sick, and the Center High School vocal director, Jack Overby, conducted. I don't remember what they got. <laughs> As our friendship grew, his daughter Pam became a music major on our campus. While she was there, the local 5 u Alpha Symphonia chapter commissioned Claude to write a piece for the band. Dan's prelude is a bit different from his other compositions. Opening with a beautiful English horn solo, it moves a very rhythmic dance section, and yes, it does have seven, eight measures. The band really enjoyed playing the piece, and I've used it quite a bit as a guest conductor. Our next commission with Claude was in honor of Harry S. Truman, the Harry S. Truman Centennial, and involved several meetings we had with Truman's personal physician while he was president, Brigadier General Thomas <coughs> Graham. We met together several times to talk about Truman and gather information about him. We premiered that work that he wrote, it, and we premiered at the Folly Theater in Kansas City on March 24, 1984, with Claude conducting and with the general in attendance. This is a major work, about 15 minutes or longer, uh, which is really a biography of Truman's life. If you have a good band, I strongly suggest you program the composition. It is historically significant, and it does include dropping the first atomic bomb. It involves a narrator, a concert choir, a female vocal soloist, and yes, the Missouri Waltz on him. In addition to his compositions for the concert band, I commissioned Claude to write six arrangements for marching band, which were used when I conducted band days for the Kansas City Chiefs. These arrangements will soon be available and will be, a good, be good feature selections in first marching band shows. When I first asked him, the first one I asked him to do, he did on Across the Wide Missouri, which is published now also in a concert version. We had hired Bill Chase, the popular jazz rock trumpet player, as a soloist with the band that day. I probably have the only copy of his solo part, which frankly can be played by very few excellent trumpet players. I would point out to about Bill, the first time I went with Chase, the first time I met him, I said, I can have the music taped on a stand and set up for you. He said, no, I'll have it memorized. And he did. He had it ready to go. In the in his part, he ended on a high B, an octave above what's called the traditional high C. And I don't think in his playing he ever got below what we call a traditional high C. <laughs> <laughs> that part will not be available in the published version. <laughs> Paul was commissioned to write two pieces for the UC of brass ensembles that were premiered with Dr. Robert Gifford, who's in the audience, uh, conducting, and these are noted, I think, in your hand. Thank you, Russ, very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Marvin Mannering, wake up. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us and giving us your perspective, uh, the perspective of an educator in the trenches. Tell us how you've been impacted by Claude and his music. You also serve as the MMEA historian, and we appreciate that very much. 
and we'd like for you to tell us how you and the MMEA board are working to help preserve Claude's legacy. How many of you remember your first Bob T. Smith piece you played? Yeah, there's a couple of tuba players in the audience. You know that we, we didn't have time to sleep during those tunes. We were definitely busy. I became acquainted with the music of this composer uh, through the North Central Missouri Bandmasters Association Clinic Band in Chillicothe. It was the go-to place in Northwest Missouri. And uh, we were so lucky to have many of Claude's pieces in manuscript on our stands when we got there. My first piece was Concert Variations. A big, brooding, sprawling piece that's just a wonderful workout for everyone in the band. If you haven't programmed it, haven't played it, I invite you to do so. It's a band. And certainly one of the staples of the literature. Um, I, I talked with, with Claude afterwards. I, I, of all the folks here who know him well, I am the least of these, but I met him and, and realized this is someone who's never been a stranger. Uh, friendly, inquisitive about what band you came from. Hey, your band director, Sarah Antone, how's she doing up there? Everything's going fine, right? Yes, sir. And we went home and made sure that it was. Uh, just, just that kind of you know, relationship that you could feel with, with bands and bandsmen across the state was really special, just right from the get-go. Uh, I was lucky enough later as band manager of Central Methodist University College, now university, uh, to help in the commissioning of uh, Joyce and Karen Hart. Uh, that uh, Phi Me Alpha and Phi Beta commission to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Central Methodist Band. And uh, we played an anniversary concert, and Claude came in and conducted that. And how many of you have played under Claude's stick? Every Tenuto. And I think we have a match made in heaven here because we want to put Claude in the hall. When you came in today, you can see we have a, a poster and a couple of QR codes with a sample letter. Write your own, but contact your legislator and let them know that this is someone who's very deserving. If, if anyone has brought notoriety and recognition to the state of Missouri, uh, it's Claude Smith. And with these 60 pieces that have been composed either for uh, ensembles here or about any aspect of our state, I think this is someone who's a fine, fine candidate for this. So I hope you'll consider doing that and encourage others to advocate as well. Thank you. Thanks, Marvin. We're going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about the resurgence uh, that Claude's music is making now and uh, continues to make as new generations of band directors and audiences learn about her. Um, panelists, I'm going to ask you, we have an eye on the clock here, so we want to keep it moving along. And we're going to go back to Pam here. Um, and Pam, tell us a little bit about how this resurgence has occurred recently. Well, recently, um, Robin, who works with me, um, we have been avidly becoming um, clinicians at different conferences throughout the country um, in New Jersey, Oklahoma, Texas next month, and others. And we just want to make sure people know about the music that's out there, especially the young band literature. Um, there were many pieces, about 40, written for Jensen in the 80s, and a lot of people don't know about those pieces. <laughs> We bought the copyrights back, and they're available, and they are great, grade two, two and a half, and three pieces. Um, so please stop by our booth because there's so many great things, right, Josh? Josh McCoy's back there, and I came back there last year to work with his band. The way they are scored, we said again, uh, I'm going to just say it one more time, they make a smaller band sound bigger, and that's kind of a unique trait and it's done very well with small bands. I'm so proud of them. Um, next is that we do a lot of work on Facebook and Instagram and, and on our website. We have a newly designed website and we invite you to come and listen because we have almost everything recorded. Um, we also are active on Facebook but we want to promote what you are doing. If you are um, doing performing a piece, send us a concert program sends us a picture of your band, we will put it on and The other way to work with Facebook is to make sure you are sharing that Facebook. There's a pamphlet over there about sharing the Facebook post so that more people, more people can learn what you are doing with Dad's music. Um, a couple things that have happened in the past in Missouri um, is the 5 8 mu the Lambda chapter of 5 8 mu right here, 
sponsors the Claude T. Smith um, Composition Contest, which Russ has been running for 30 years, and just now going off of that post. But because of that, they have attracted composers from all over the United States and the world in that, and Dad loved to make sure that young composers were featured. He wanted to make sure young composers had a chance. So that happened three years ago when Robert Langenfeld was the winner, and we now publish two of his works. One is gonna be performed tomorrow, Milestones, with Dr. Purcell and the UCM Wind Ensemble. So it just kind of keeps giving and giving and giving. Um, we do support um, five educational scholarships at the schools that he had at, at effect. Carrollton, Chillicothe, Missouri State, University of Central Missouri, and Central Methodist. So you'll probably, I don't know if there's any recipients in here, but we give out a scholarship every year to those schools. Um, next, we also, with our company, Howard's expanding and supporting the ensembles of Russ Coleman and Phil Wood. So we are excited to have those available. And if you've heard, heard Roadkill or the Boone County Bassoon Band, those pieces are now on publication and can be ordered through Barnhouse. Um, I'm also guest conducting whenever I can, and I'd love to come and work with your band and tell them stories, but mainly we want to share your successes with the music. Marvin, a couple of years ago, your band was here at MMBA, the Stockton High School <coughs> band, and you uh, programmed Claude's Overture for a festival. Tell us how that was a good teaching piece for your band, and how was it and other Claude Smith pieces relevant today in meeting standards in teaching and for adjudication? Well, the, the selection of the piece is easy, or at least the selection of the composer. I mean, the, the thinking was, dance with the one that brought you. And, and I've certainly taken time each year to program at least one piece uh, by Claude, and I found that they're wonderful teaching pieces. They're layered in such a way that if, if you're around public schools and, and you, you are around the cafeteria enough, you realize that there's a whole lot of sameness. And when you're looking for a little color, these are the pieces to look for. And there is safety in them too. I think if you need proof the Declaration Overture can be played by a small band, you found that down in Salon A this morning. And it, it works. And the saying in baseball goes, the baseball will find you. And as far as these pieces go, all of your players need to, need, they will develop the strength, they will develop the, you know, the capacity to really function in the band. Uh, there's no place to hide when you play one of these pieces, but you can be secure in all the, all the uh, layering and scoring. It's, it's like good architecture. You use solid building materials and it's put together in a really strong way and it's durable and it holds up. And uh, I wanted to be sure that we paid tribute to a composer who has made a difference for us as a band, and I think definitely made a difference for all of us here in Missouri as well. I think that's all. Well, I've, I've tried to shorten that up, and I don't know how well I did. Thanks, Margaret. You're doing great. Uh, Johnny Woody, you're known throughout the world as one of the greatest horn players uh, of all time. You had a very distinguished career with the Air Force Band. Tell us what you've experienced with Claude's music nationwide as well as internationally. Who could talk, who talk, who's he talking to about being the greatest horn player? Arnold uh, Gabriel. Uh, no, I was not the greatest horn player in the world, but uh, I was adequate. Uh, <laughs> now, I retired the very day the flight was, was, was prepared. Uh, flight, yes, so he hoped that also to pay me back. Uh, because it's, uh, it starts off with lip drills from IG to IA for three bars. And, and uh, it, it's done a couple of times, but uh, I never got to play it. Uh, it was a de dedication to the, the uh, Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. One of the things that I was going to talk about was the popularity of Claude in Japan. I mean, Japan is crazy about Claude's music. A Festival Variations was played by a high school, all-girl band with no music. That's what they could do in Japan. Yamaha, I worked for Yamaha after I retired from the Air Force for many years. And what, uh, they called me up and said, Yamaha band is going to be playing special variations for a special occasion, a ceremony or something, or an anniversary, something like that. Would you write the program notes? 
which I was more than happy to do. And I wrote the program notes in English, of course, sent them to a great friend of mine who worked for the, who I knew from Yamaha days. He, tra he translated it. And he translated it back into English. It wasn't close to what I said originally. <laughs> but anyway, I have a recording of that piece. The Yamaha band is the band that's composed of all the workers at the Yamaha factory. You have to work at the factory to be in the band. And some of the players are playing instruments they made. So, and then, but Claude's Yamaha, but I'm sorry, Festival Variations is played all over Japan. Claude's music is played all over Japan. Funny story, I'm working on an International Horn Society, I'm at a table. A, a Japanese young man came up to the table, was looking at our horns, and he looked at me, he saw my name. And he looks at me, he goes, oh. <laughs> Starts singing the opening of Festival Oh, and he had to take a picture, you know. That's a true story. But that, Claude is worldwide, especially here in Japan. You know, play his music game, because all the parts are well written, they're, they're played, they may sound easy, but they're not. You have to work at it. That's how Claude wrote it. You know, he made the band sell better, makes the kids sell better. Robin, would you please tell us a little bit about the uh, new engravings that are going on with some of Claude's more popular pieces, and also how his music is uh, so popular today with community adult bands? Uh, yeah, I'm, and I'm speaking for Andy. Uh, he uh, was so happy that he had the chance, or that he does have the chance to re-engrave some of the pieces. And uh, he, this time said he did a computer instead. Uh, he, and not using the ruler, <laughs> uh, he is the assistant conductor of the Overland Park Civic Band in, in Overland Park, Kansas. And so he has the opportunity to play some of Claude's music. And then, as a matter of fact, the Overland Park Band was one of the, uh, Civic Band was one of the bands that would uh, try out some of his new pieces, too. So, you know, it goes around, comes around. And they uh, performed Incidental Suite two years ago. He already conducted uh, Decoration Overture. And then coming up, uh, oh, and the Symphonic uh, Prelude on the Testa Fidelis. And then coming up in, in April, on April 23rd, he's gonna conduct Acclamation, which he's, he said he's been studying for over 40 years. And he wrote for the uh, Army Band in 1970. Russ, you've had the opportunity to conduct bands all over the world. Tell us how introducing Claude's music to those students internationally has increased its popularity. You also program some of his music for your community band concerts as well. How has this influenced the resurgence in Claude's music? After I retired from UCM, I spent four semesters in Tokyo, spread out over 10 years as the conductor of the Busashino Wind Ensemble, which is just a fabulous organization. And I've programmed three of his compositions over that period of time. One of my favorite pieces of his that's really not played that much, it's pretty hard though, is Dance Falatra. A very uh, kind of hard piece, but really one of his great pieces. Uh, unfortunately, uh, each time I'm there, we do a recording of three pieces with the top Sony group, and uh, they bring in about 80 mics and six or eight people down doing everything you know that they have to do. But at any rate, um, when we did this, uh, recorded the Dance Philatra, later on they did not release that one recording of all the things I done. So I finally got up the courage to ask why. They said there was one chip trumpet note. We didn't have one to replace that one. So, too bad. <laughs> um, another piece that we did there on tour was the piece he wrote for Gary Foster, that, uh, where he featured Gary playing flute, clarinet, and then saxophone. And I used it with the first chair player standing up and playing the part, or what it was. And we did that on tour. It's, if you have a guest soloist or something that can do those three instruments, or you can just pick out one of the movements, it's really a great piece of music. I enjoy it a lot. I also use this uh, a Christmas medley different from Green Band. It's not over there. 
Each summer, I programmed several of his pieces with the Warrensburg Community Band and included there the uh, premier performance of his concerto for two horns that uh, I got permission to change it over. Uh, I had two good horn players in my band, uh, Bill Lane, who was principal in L.A. Phil, and then the horn teacher at UCM, and so I had, had them play it, and it's now published that way, too. I'd like to say a few words kind of in my bit of the closing about it all. It bothers me, there's a trend among band directors to only perform new compositions. We should do that, but we should not neglect the large amount of music available to us from the past. In our field, there's the music of Claude, Alfred Green, Francis Macbeth, Frank Garrix, and many others. Our audiences would enjoy and relate to their composition. Programming is perhaps why we have few professional concert bands, but many professional symphony orchestras. Our symphony orchestras program traditional music, and include one new composition on each concert. Perhaps that a lesson, that's a lesson to be learned. Don't forget the great music of the past. Don't forget the great music of all Thank you. Thank you. We've heard so many wonderful stories, uh, so many things about Claude and his music, and there's been laughter, there's been a lot of nodding heads I've seen in the audience. That really speaks to how important uh, this man's impact has been on all of us, and what the resurgence his music is now having, continues to have, and as I said earlier, we're hopeful that our activities will help introduce this man's music to a whole generation of new band conductors as well as audiences. Um, I just want to add one other personal thing here. Uh, the first time I met Claude Smith was in 1977 or 78, and I had gone to a concert at Ledoux High School in St. Louis. Tom Poshak was the director, and Tom had commissioned a work, Prelude for Man, which uh, Claude composed and conducted the premiere. I was, I really hate the term band nerd because I think it's kind of pejorative, but that's what I was in high school back then. And I had the two LP record set of Claude's music that Winter Jones had put out. Uh, for those of you young people in the audience, LPs were like oversized CDs. And I took it to the concert with the hope of maybe having Claude autograph it for me. And after the concert, he spent almost an hour with me talking to me about composition and arranging and orchestration and where he got his ideas and his philosophies of music. And I was just a 16 or 17 year old kid who just must have been annoying as all heck. But he could not have been more gracious. He could not have been more kind. He was really interested in me and what I wanted to do in the future. And yes, he autographed my record, and I have it to this day. It's one of my most prized possessions. I think we have time for just a couple of uh, questions to anybody on the panel, if anybody has one, or if you have uh, an anecdote or a story or anything that you wish to share about Claude or his music. All right. I'm D. Lewis, retired band director of Marshfield. Uh, Claude was president of MBBA. I got a phone call from him after I had just lost the uh, uh, election for band vice president of MBBA. And I think he knew I was willing, or I wouldn't have uh, tried to get that job. At any rate, he said, we need a new editor of the or a school music magazine, which you consider doing. I had no background for that sort of thing, but I kind of enjoyed writing. But my wife taught English. I said, if you help me, yeah, I'll do it. But I wanted to tell you this. Claude got me, with 35 years, editing that magazine, an important part of my life, our lives. Uh, and I thank Claude for that. But, Claude, you heard about what a fine, just a fine fellow. What kind of guy you want to take on the road trip with you? <laughs> uh, uh, I've never heard Paul say a derogatory, not a word, and we're kind of a competitive society. So some of us probably do too much of that. Never heard a word of that out of Claude, except I told him that I was playing, uh, look at me, I'm at a senior moment. Uh, Russian Christmas music, who wrote me, 
Alfred Reed. Well, we were playing here at one of our performances, and I told Claude that I had cut it to make sure I got in under time. And he said, well, Alfred, we need to be cut anyway. <laughs> Any other comments or any questions or anything else that we can <coughs> share with you? Yeah, we did it. Yay! I want to thank you all for being here. Let's have a round of applause for our family.